Hi there, this is Rob Arntfield speaking to you again. I'm the Medical Director at the Critical Care Trauma Centre in London, Ontario, where I also direct the Critical Care Ultrasound Program. Today we are going to talk about goal-directed echo in respiratory failure. And this screencast came about, of course, given the current pandemic situation and a fuller understanding of point-of-care echo and goal-directed echo is generally being sought by many members of the ultrasound community. And so I hope you find this tutorial useful in bridging any gaps you may find in your technical or cognitive understanding of this topic. Our agenda today will include the overview of goal-directed echo as a whole, very briefly, and we'll review some of the typical views that you'll find in goal-directed echo with a focus only on 2D echo views. We will not be reviewing Doppler or spectral Doppler in particular, though I will provide a couple of resources along the way for those of you with an appetite for those techniques. We'll review the cardiac scope that is ideal for assessing those with respiratory failure, and in particular with COVID-19, though we will emphasize that there are no pathognomonic findings on cardiac ultrasound of COVID-19. And then we'll break down some relevant pathology that is useful to look for in all comers who present with respiratory failure, no matter where you are assessing them with goal-directed echo. Why now for echocardiography? Well, there's been unprecedented change in the way all of us are doing our business, including at the hospital. And the way patients are being assessed is obviously changing as well. We are seeking to minimize our exposure to patients in the setting of uncertain infectious risks to us as providers. And we are also seeking to preserve personal protective equipment in a large number of work environments. And so maximizing the value and return on any in-person encounters is essential. And this really underscores the value of goal-directed echo as a tool that can be used to address emergent changes in circulatory status, look for corroborating features of respiratory disease, features on cardiac ultrasound that might support a different respiratory diagnosis than you initially suspected. And so all of these things should drive us to be doing more goal-directed echo. In addition, many societies, as well as hospitals and hospital systems, have largely placed a moratorium on conventional diagnostic echo workflows for those, especially in the ICU or emergency department. And so this has put a significant strain on access to echocardiography in many centers. And largely, most of these societies have pointed towards point-of-care echo as being the bridge for this gap in care. And what, of course, will be interesting is to know is how much of this workflow remains in the post-pandemic era. As mentioned, there's limited sensibility in repeating our physical contact with patients these days, and so we might as well make the most of the encounter. And this really gets at the heart of what many of us have been approaching for years, which is the concept of a whole body ultrasound approach, which is to do lung, echo, DVT, central line, do it all at once, as all of these organ systems really speak to each other, and we needn't be confined by various organ systems as clinicians who look after the whole patient. And of course, we know there are a significant number of cardiac findings that we may find in those with respiratory failure, and pertinent negatives are almost as important as pertinent positives in the setting of those with unexplained or even explained respiratory failure. So with respect to goal-directed echo, it goes by many names. Ultimately, though, the same scope uh, applies no matter where you're doing it, whether it's the emergency department, the pre-hospital environment, the ICU, the OR, etc. And our aim is really to narrow the diagnostic considerations and hone in on nuanced therapeutic approaches for our patients with respiratory failure. Many of our patients with respiratory failure obviously have a cardiac or circulatory failure component as well. And so again, highlighting the value of often incorporating multiple organs at once in a single ultrasound encounter. If you want a more thorough overview of point of care echo techniques, uh, I'm partial to our uh, Western Sano uh, .ca website where we have a number of directed tutorials on various themes within point of care echo. And of course, a massive repository of extremely useful information is found on the Sauna Site Institute. Which views should you entertain? Well, the common goal directed echo views will be reviewed here. The first is the parasternal long axis obtained in the parasternal space, of course, and its uh, sibling view is the parasternal short axis at the papillary muscle level. These views are frequently acquired first in your exam protocol, though patient and clinician factors may vary that approach. Sometimes these windows are not available, which is why we'll emphasize the subcostal view uh, shortly. 
However, these views provide an excellent overview of pericardium, LV function, and some glimpse at the RV and septal kinetics, as well as a global assessment of the mitral and aortic valves. The apical space, though challenging sometimes in the critically ill patients and those with dyspnea, positive pressure ventilation, uh, or both, will provide the best example for comparing right ventricular size to left ventricular size. And so this is going to come up a lot in this tutorial, so getting good at this view will pay dividends, especially for those in respiratory failure. The sibling view to the apical 4 chamber is the apical 5 chamber, which really is not going to come to bear in this tutorial too much, but because I will direct you to consider embarking upon a journey of learning how to do stroke volume, uh, this will be the view that you will use probably most frequently and is obtained by merely tilting the transducer anteriorly in order to bring out that aortic valve, uh, which is the so-called uh, fifth chamber along with the LVOT seen there. From the subcostal space, we have the four chamber views seen here on screen left and the subcostal short axis on the screen right. The four chamber view is quite a nice backup view for the comparison of the right ventricle to the left ventricle if obtained on axis. And the short axis view is the backup view for the parasternal short axis view at the papillary muscle level. And these two views are often what we have to use primarily in those patients with significant degrees of hyperinflation on ventilators whose hearts are displaced caudally and made very, very easy to assess by cardiac ultrasound in the subcostal space and made nearly impossible sometimes in the parasternal spaces. Lastly, in the subcostal window is the IVC long axis view, and we'll unpack the value of this view as we go along. So with respect to COVID and echo in particular, I want to re-emphasize that there's no pathognomonic findings for COVID. And in fact, the evidence that there is a cardiac component to this disease at all is actually not immediately evident. There is a lot of documentation about heart failure or concerns about myocarditis in these patients because of a lot of serologic studies that have shown troponin or BNP elevations in these patients. However, the primary and most common echo findings is really one of a normal echo. And so I do want to emphasize this because there's a lot of attention about a viral cardiomyopathy or viral myocarditis circulating around, and that's not really been proven. And as I said, troponin rises are commonly seen in up to a third of patients, but the troponin leak that we see in critically ill patients across all infectious etiologies is non-trivial, and I attribute a lot of this to that same mechanism. So a lot of uh, dialogue about the concept of a myocarditis picture, and there's a few case reports, though I will emphasize that no case reports include pathology or biopsies demonstrating that the causes of heart failure are indeed virally mediated. So it may be this is an entity, but it's not clear that it's A, an entity, or B, very common at all. Uh, that said, let's review it. So the myocarditis picture will present with a global reduction in LV function, as can be seen here in the parasternal short axis view with a severely reduced left ventricular systolic function that is not regional but is in fact a global. And that's the most likely evidence of this syndrome, if indeed it exists. So what will you see instead on echo? Well, you'll see something looking like this, a largely normal or possibly even hyperdynamic echocardiogram. So we have the parasternal long, the parasternal short at the papillary muscle level, the subcostal four chamber, and the IVC. Now these are real images from real COVID patient, and so you know this is not laboratory quality images. However, you can see here that for the most part, there's not a lot in the way of actionable findings. And if you're new to interpreting what the findings might be, that's what we're going to spend the rest of the screencast really drilling down on. In terms of what we should be looking for in these patients, not a lot has really changed in my opinion. However, there have been sort of contemporary guidelines produced uh, in response to this pandemic by a couple of the overarching echo societies or cardiovascular health societies. And I'm gonna borrow this table from the ASE document, which is quite nice and emphasizing the things we might be looking for in a goal-directed approach for the left ventricle, right ventricle, pericardium, and valves. Of note, we won't cover valves in detail, but I will have a short slide on them uh, a little bit later because valves uh, are not our immediate priority in these patients. So let's first talk about the right ventricle and some of the relevant considerations. 
Right ventricular dysfunction is extremely common in those with respiratory failure, particularly those with ARDS. It's seen in about 20%, at least 20% of patients when you look for it, and contributes to significant morbidity and does increase the risk of death in these patients. The mechanism is some combination of hypoxic vasoconstriction, we believe, increased afterload to the right heart, as well as some heart-lung interactions related to the ventilator. Thrombophilia is extremely common in those with COVID, as we know, uh, despite DVT prophylaxis. And so examining for point-of-care evidence of right ventricular strain as a consequence of a pulmonary embolism is of even increasing value in this patient population, where transporting for CT is uh, generally not preferred if we can avoid it. Uh, septic cardiomyopathy, imagining that your patient may or may not have COVID, but may have another infectious cause of respiratory failure, uh, is common in certainly in bacterial causes of sepsis, and the RV may be involved in a third of those cases. With respect to venothromboembolic disease, we are seeing a shocking burden of this problem despite adequate DVT prophylaxis. It's clear that COVID in some patients is a hypercoagulable state, and so some mechanism through either assessing the right ventricle, as we're talking about now, but also uh, in venous Dopplers or venous compression ultrasound uh, at the point of care is going to be helpful to surveil these patients and distinguish uh, diagnoses uh, in real time. So let's look at a couple normal right ventricles from the apical four-chamber view. As I mentioned, this view is favored for assessment of the right ventricle, it allows easy comparison and size to the left ventricle. And so we see here the shape of the right ventricle, firstly, is one that's I consider sort of triangular in shape. Uh, and I always think of it sort of as being a companion chamber to the left ventricle um, who doesn't make itself known unless there's real problems. And so I think that that generally applies to these two images. You can see the RV is, uh, is sort of just a sidecar, if you will, alongside the left ventricle. It shows nice uh, systolic movement, which is generally a movement of the tricuspid annulus towards its own apex. And so these would be a couple examples of normal size, normal uh, function right ventricles. So the question is, what are you looking for with an abnormal right ventricle? And the right ventricle is a bit more challenging because it's a bit of a laundry list of things that can go wrong with it. And uh, so we'll break those down now. The biggest one is a, a chamber enlargement. So the RV that has failed must be enlarged. You cannot really have a major right ventricular problem without it being overwhelmed uh, and uh, enlarged. And so that is the one we'll emphasize a fair bit. We'll talk a little bit about systolic function, uh, though again, many failed right ventricles might even have preserved systolic function, but there may be evidence of pressure or volume overload from an acute process. So uh, being mindful of how the RV contracts systolically is useful. However, its uh, reduction in systolic function is not nearly as important as gauging for enlarged size. The septum will go awry in these patients eventually and develop either what's called a septal bounce or a paradoxical septal motion, where typically during systole, the septum will move in the opposite direction as a result of increased afterload to the right ventricle. And gradually as this process evolves, it, it evolves to one where the septum is no longer uh, restoring to a normal configuration uh, in one phase of the cardiac cycle and remains in a flattened shape uh, throughout the entire cardiac cycle leading to a flat septum or what's called a D-shaped left ventricle. We'll see some examples of that shortly. A dilated IVC is the corroborating feature that confirms that the RV is indeed uh, failed and we'll look for that. And we'll talk a little bit about some chronic RV failure findings momentarily as well. Lastly, I want to say that Doppler, while not a subject of our tutorial today, is quite valuable in these patients, and in advanced users, they may examine things like right ventricular systolic pressures or acceleration times uh, out of the right ventricular outflow track. So looking at an acutely dysfunctional right ventricle, we see here the two broad buckets of uh, ventricular dysfunction or size dysfunction that we typically use, which is one of moderate dysfunction, which describes a right ventricle, which is more than two-thirds the size of the left ventricle. And then on screen right, we have a severely uh, dysfunctional and severely enlarged right ventricle because it is larger than the left ventricle. If we look at the moderate example here, we see that the uh, RV is enlarged as compared to the previous normal examples I showed you. It's no longer sort of this passive chamber that is 
uh, less noticeable. It's it's quite present here on, on the screen. You see that it doesn't quite dominate the apex uh, of the view, but it's beginning to encroach upon the apex. And if you look at the diameter in uh, end diastole, just with your eyeballs, you can again see that it's it's certainly uh, more than two thirds the size of that left ventricle. Uh, interestingly, you can see here the systolic function is relatively preserved. Um, as to my previous comment, the systolic function is not a reliable indicator of uh, how excited to get about right ventricular failure and size should really be your main focus. In the severely dilated right ventricle, we see here the right ventricle is now larger than the left ventricle. We see that um, it is now dominating the apex of this view, of this apical four chamber view. And uh, this is, um, you know, again, a progression of disease or a more severe example of right ventricular failure. Of note, as the right ventricle dilates, you will often be able to see the architecture of the ventricle a little bit better within the apex. And given that clot is a concern in many of these patients, it's important to acknowledge that there's a lot of trabeculation and a moderator band and structures that are in the apex of the right ventricle that are normal. So if you're new to this, please understand that you'll see a lot more in the apex of the right ventricle as it enlarges typically uh, than under normal conditions, and this is not to be concerned about. With respect to the septum, I commented on the early phase of paradoxical septal motion, uh, which typically is a systolic event where uh, during uh, right ventricular systole, uh, the increased pressure pushes the septum into the left ventricle. This could be seen here on this apical four chamber view, and you can see it here on this peristernal short axis view. As this phenomenon increases and we have both volume and pressure overload to the uh, right side, the septum may remain largely uh, pushed over towards the left ventricle um, in both phases of the cardiac cycle, cycle leading to uh, a flattened septum uh, and or a what's called a D-shaped left ventricle as a result. And so this is merely a progression of disease and altered septal kinetics are one of the many uh, features, as we've outlined, that may tell you that the right ventricle is failed. An additional finding, which uh, we've been hearing about from some colleagues uh, with higher volumes of COVID, uh, include that they've identified a number of clots in transit in these patients, and uh, it's a very satisfying finding when you identify it because it, of course, confirms the pulmonary embolism diagnosis uh, that is in your mind often when you identify an acutely dilated right heart as can be seen here and attention to the right atrium reveals that there appears to be an isoechoic sort of serpiginous structure flopping around while there is a differential for that uh, structure that must be respected in the appropriate clinical context a clot in transit is perfectly reasonable uh, for that and may indeed influence your clinical management in these patients it often arises that a uh, enlarged right ventricle is identified and there's uncertainty among providers about whether this is an old phenomenon or a new phenomenon for this patient. Uh, and this is difficult to disentangle sometimes. However, there's a couple things that I tend to use. Uh, the main one, to be honest, is the size of the right atrium. These are two examples of uh, really bad right hearts that are chronically been uh, under some stress and it's been passed back to the right atrium leading to significant right atrial remodeling. You can see the right atrium is nearly the same size as the right ventricle in these cases. The other thing to observe is not just the size of the right atrium, but also the interatrial septum, which uh, can be seen here and here, and you can see it is pushed over to the left atrium, so confirming that right atrial pressure has been chronically elevated uh, above left atrial pressure. So these features help give me a fair bit of confidence that while there could be an acute right ventricular process going on, there's certainly also a chronic process uh, that has been in the background. And identifying chronic RV failure in these patients with respiratory failure is of great importance and uh, as, it, as it significantly influences uh, their uh, mortality risk, as this is a very difficult condition to manage, certainly in somebody who has an additional burden to their right heart with hypoxic vasoconstriction, possibly a ventilator, and a number of fluid shifts and vasoactive medications if they end up in the ICU. And so here's a comparison just uh, for those of you who are seeking to build your comfort with these concepts of the acutely dysfunctional right ventricle on screen left compared to a chronically dysfunctional right ventricle on screen right. Uh, again, you can see both in both cases the RV is enlarged. However, we see this atrium is quite large compared to this atrium, and we see that um, even in the, uh, this cut here, you can see the tricuspid valve is also kind of quite splayed. The tricuspid annulus is stretched quite widely, again, remodeling that happens over time. 
Uh, I've not been able to find a satisfying answer as to over what time frame this remodeling occurs, uh, but it certainly isn't within hours. Uh, so if, if there's been an acute deterioration of your patient and you're concerned about the right ventricle and your first look at the RV reveals this picture, um, you're not dealing with only an acute process. Another aid to distinguish the acute from chronic right ventricular failure is the RV wall thickness. The wall thickness uh, is best appreciated from the subcostal four chamber view where the ultrasound beam is largely perpendicular to the RV wall and uh, so it resolves the wall a fair bit better. And uh, here you can see subjectively, just looking at this loop, that the RV wall is unusually thick. It's approximating the thickness, in fact, even of the interventricular septum. So without any measurements, you can sort of make that estimation here. Even though the right ventricle itself doesn't appear significantly enlarged, uh, this does underscore the likelihood that this patient has a chronic process. And uh, if you do want to get quantitative, then the subcostal view during diastole is the time to do this. And uh, this is done with calipers uh, measuring the uh, wall thickness here. And you can see here a measurement of 1.14 centimeters. Uh, generally, the cut line in the diagnostic laboratories is half a centimeter. My experience is that half a centimeter is not terribly uncommon in a lot of patients in the ICU or those with respiratory failure, and so I'll often push that limit for a greater specificity up towards a centimeter for my own personal practice before I get too, too excited that there's definitely a chronic process underscoring the patient presentation. I want to mention the IVC. The IVC does not have a lot of utility in my view in those with respiratory failure. However, uh, we will highlight two uses today. One is in corroborating your right ventricular assessment. If despite all you, what I've discussed here and all the different findings, you remain unsure or equivocal on whether or not the right ventricle has failed, you can use the IVC as a supporting measure. And so the right ventricle fails filling pressure to the right side of the heart must increase by definition. And so if they increase, the IVC should become plethoric. So if you see an IVC like this that shows nice respiratory variation, it's unlikely you have meaningful right ventricular failure. Even if the patient is sort of on the drier side, their, their, their right ventricle cannot be congested and not pass that congestion backwards to the IVC. Unlike this image here, where you can see there's no respiratory variation of the IVC, the IVC itself looks dilated. It's at least uh, probably two, two and a half centimeters. And so this is consistent with RV failure, but not diagnostic. So it's sensitive, but not specific. Whereas this is reasonably specific, such that you may rule out uh, meaningful RV failure with a varying IVC. So let's talk about the left ventricle now. Uh, the left ventricle, of course, gets the lion's share of our attention when considering uh, patients in shock. We're most uh, aware and thoughtful r related to left-sided cardiogenic shock pictures. So this is probably less new to many of you, um, but we wanna frame this in the context of respiratory failure uh, as part of the spirit of this tutorial. And so if your patient has uh, respiratory failure from a infectious etiology, again, particularly bacterial etiologies, are more likely to cause aseptic cardiomyopathy. Um, we'll see this in 20 to 60% of those with septic shock. It's not clear, as I said, that COVID will lead to this, but it's useful to be on the lookout. And largely, septic cardiomyopathy will create a reversible depression in LV function without regionality. So it won't be just focal wall segments that will be down, it'll be the whole ventricle. And you know the thing to note physiologically is that these patients often are vasodilated as well. And so even though their LV might look quite startling, some of these patients are able to maintain their stroke volume because they have very low afterload. So let's look at some left ventricular findings and we'll talk a little bit about specifically the cardiomyopathy findings towards the end of this section. So the left ventricle, when it's hyperdynamic, which is extremely common in these patients because they are vasodilated, uh, is uh, seen here, hyperdynamic state in the left ventricle. We can see the walls touching, uh, and you can see here in the short axis, the papillary muscles uh, kissing each other, consistent with somebody who's at the upper end of their ejection fraction. Many people will falsely assume that the appearance of this ventricle is an invitation for volume loading and for intravenous fluids. And so I want to emphasize that hyperdynamic ventricles, especially in those who have already had a reasonable trial of volume, is more likely a response to being vasodilated than it is to being hypovolemic. So one of the ways we can harm our patients with echo is by trying to 
quote unquote, fill up a ventricle that looks like either of these after they've already demonstrated no meaningful change in heart rate or in uh, blood pressure to volume. So be aware of that pitfall with the hyperdynamic ventricle. Now, when considering systolic dysfunction, uh, the buckets we tend to use are moderate and severe dysfunction. Mild dysfunction doesn't generally warrant any action. And so we're interested in sorting these findings into really two main buckets. And so the moderately dysfunctional LV is a little more subtle. Uh, and it, it, because it's really a spectrum of findings, we see here in the long axis decreased uh, overall thickening of the left ventricular muscle. We see decreased chamber size reduction or excursion of the left ventricle. And we see that the mitral valve movement uh, doesn't really approximate the septum. It, 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 it moves a little bit, but it doesn't really get past sort of parallel with the, um, uh, with the annulus. Now, when you look at severe dysfunction, severe dysfunction is not hard to appreciate. So you really actually want to spend most of your time in getting good at appreciating moderate dysfunction, which to the untrained eye uh, may pass as normal. Uh, the good news is, of course, in real goal-directed echo, you're not going to rely on a single view to make any of these decisions. But in the severely dysfunctional heart, we can appreciate there's very little thickening, there's very little valve movement, and the chamber size really does not reduce uh, in between uh, systole uh, and diastole in a meaningful way. When looking at these views, uh, these findings in a short axis projection, we see moderate dysfunction here. Um, and severe dysfunction, again, characterized by similar findings of decreased thickening and decreased excursion. The short axis is often the easiest view to make uh, more confident pronouncements on LV function, given you have all four walls and just generally have a higher sampling rate of actual left heart tissue to look at with your eyes. Now, I mentioned septic cardiomyopathy. We uh, had a nice echo case of this a few years ago that we published a little report on, and uh, it highlighted the speed and magnitude of the change in ventricular function that can occur as a patient who presented with gram-negative bacteremia from a procedure. And uh, here you can see the heart on presentation, hyperdynamic as they begin to vasodilate. And then uh, uh, within hours, the patient's uh, heart was uh, grinding to a little bit of a halt here as a consequence, we believe, of the mechanism of endotoxin and cytokine uh, release as part of the uh, septic picture. And so it's not uncommon for these changes to occur, and this highlights the value in reassessing people uh, somewhat regularly with goal-directed echo in the context of respiratory failure. And uh, of note, within a couple days, the heart function had returned to normal in this patient after they had source control and cleared their infection. And of course, we've broken down the left and right ventricles separately so far, but uh, these chambers are, are in series with each other, so obviously the dysfunction to both of them is not uncommon, uh, especially even with cardi cardiomyopathy of a septic origin. And so here's an apical core chamber projection that shows the uh, reduction in uh, function for both chambers, which obviously pretends a, a worse uh, prognosis and, and greater challenges to manage in the acute setting, especially if they also have respiratory failure. With respect to the pericardium, the pericardium gets a lot of attention with goal-directed echo, of course, because uh, pericardial tamponade is relatively easy to pick up uh, and is uh, sufficiently uh, difficult to otherwise diagnose. And so uh, myocarditis or pericarditis may be a uh, cause of... Um, may be a consequence of an infectious etiology that you may be contending with, uh, viruses, of course, included. Uh, we're unsure about the true burden of this problem with COVID. Um, but ultimately, any patient in respiratory failure may indeed be uh, suffering uh, from pericardial effusion or uh, tamponade. And so let's briefly look at this from the subcostal view. Now, we see examples here of small, moderate, or large effusions. Uh, which are measured at the end of diastole, uh, of course, and the subcostal view is a pretty good one to do so. Now, um, the large effusions don't need a lot of uh, decision-making, especially if they're critically ill, um, and, but the small and moderates people can get tripped up on a little bit uh, in light of it's unclear how significant they are and how much they're contributing to the patient's acuity. So my suggestion is to use the IVC instead of any sort of advanced echocardiographic parameters, if you're a novice, use your IVC view to triage these situations. If the patient has a dilated IVC or one that's plethoric as this one is, then 
just as in the right heart failure situation, the congestion or strangulation of the heart from the pericardial space is plausible because it's now being passed back to the IVC. And that's a reasonable indication then to escalate to either a comprehensive or advanced echocardiogram and or an interdisciplinary discussion with whoever does pericardiosynthesis at your center. Uh, it's my feeling that all the advanced echo parameters in the world do not, do not allow you to confidently decide what should be done with every pericardial effusion. And I think everyone's experience uh, in the world would be variable enough that uh, we could probably say that there's no clear set of criteria that governs the indication for procedure. So my suggestion, as I said, is to use the IVC to aid in your decision making. Of course, tamponade is a clinical diagnosis we always hear and we always promote. However, we can't ignore the value of echocardiography and helping move along our considerations. Now, if the effusion is one you're worried about, but you find an IVC that looks like this, and it's a circumferential effusion, not a regional effusion, like after a procedure or after penetrating trauma, then this has a very powerful negative predictive value to rule out tamponade. And so if you want looking for some additional reassurance, uh, then you know a, a, an IVC that shows good respirophasic variation cannot actually be tamponade, except in the ex absolutely exceptional case reportable scenarios. And seeing as we're talking about the IVC, I want to mention a couple things about it. Uh, there is no widely accepted way to use the IVC to guide fluid therapy across disciplines and hospitals and various providers. There simply is not one that has been agreed upon by groups of people, even within the same clinical groups. So the idea that this tool is going to someday show us the way for fluid loading, I think has to be slowly let go of. I'm sorry to break it to you. Uh, I do think, however, that patients with respiratory failure in general, you don't need the IVC because you should just be keeping these patients as dry as possible without inducing hypovolemic shock or other organ failures because we know that any additional lung water is deleterious to these patients' work of breathing and to their gas exchange. If patients do have a low blood pressure and can't be supported with vasoactive medications, for instance, if you're on the ward or you're in a pre-hospital environment, um, then you know the only tool in your toolkit is typically fluids. And so I understand that fluid administration is often indicated simply because it's the only thing available. That said, this is another call for uh, echo because this is really a cultural flaw and has nothing to do with the underlying physiology of the patient. So if you use echo instead to map the physiology of the patient uh, and determine their likelihood to tolerate volume or identify complex features of their heart that would predict that volume or no volume that you're going to have a hard time threading the needle of managing a circulatory failure or multi-organ failure without support from vasoactive medications or invasive monitoring, then that's a great role for ECHO to quickly triage those patients so you can have earlier conversations with step-down units or ICU environments. We didn't touch on valves in any particular detail today, partly because valves really reflect that intersection of goal-directed ECHO and the uh, advanced ECHO spaces. That said, the novice or intermediate user can certainly uh, use their eyes to appreciate valvular abnormalities quite readily. And color Doppler, though we don't cover it in detail here and does need some uh, training, uh, can be readily applied to screen for left-sided valvular catastrophes, which obviously can cause respiratory failure. And every year we see two or three cases that masquerade as pneumonia or something else. And indeed, it's just a missed valve catastrophe. So it's a useful tool for sure, um, And so, but not, not covered directly here. One of the main things to do is just to look at the valve. Does it open normally? Is it thick? Um, and if you're not sure, then that's a great indication to talk to someone who's got a bit more experience. For instance, this mitral valve here, it looks quite thick, it opens poorly, um, it looks highly suspicious of mitral stenosis, and, you know, it may not be your job to uh, quantify that, but it's certainly worth understanding that in combination with noticing that the left atrium is dilated, uh, you might escalate that for a uh, second opinion and appreciate that this patient's complexity is higher if indeed they're presenting with, say, an infectious cause of respiratory failure. I've mentioned Doppler a couple times now, and I'm not meaning to hold back on it, but it is, it is indeed a, a separate chapter, really, in the story of echocardiography, and one that I think is quite valuable for many people to learn, uh, but at the same time, we don't want to uh, restrict access to echo and 
But at the same time, we want to acknowledge that a great amount of the value of ECHO is really in the views we've emphasized today. Uh, if you have an interest in uh, learning more about how to do some Doppler techniques, um, uh, here's the link to our tutorial on stroke volume determination, uh, or indeed the Sonocyte Institute has a, a couple screencasts about Doppler also. Transesophageal echo is, uh, again, a time-honored tool for our use at the point of care, especially for those who are really only for those who are intubated, however, so frequently used in the ICU or in the emergency setting for intubated patients or in the OR. Um, and it could be used to replicate the scope that we've highlighted today. It does not need to be used uh, simply uh, to answer only high complexity questions. And I would uh, emphasize, of course, that in the age of respiratory failure and COVID, that its additional value is in guiding um, device insertions or ECMO cannulations, as we've heard a lot about and uh, been using ourselves. And so you can use, uh, again, just to assess the left ventricle here, or you can use it to assess guide wires and, and, and cannulate insertions as well. So I want to emphasize that TE does have a role in this pandemic if you're facile with it and have one at your center. So how should you think about your findings in closing? Well, you need to think about on the initial assessment of respiratory failure, you want to be asking, does the cardiac exam suggest a cardiac cause of respiratory failure? Is there features of right heart failure that you think are new that could reflect a pulmonary embolism? Or is the left side failed? And this might not be actually an infectious cause of respiratory failure, but in fact, cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Are there features of cardiac disease that might complicate your management of the patient with uh, with respiratory failure, as I've alluded to. Is your fluid management going to be difficult because you've got chronic pulmonary hypertension findings? Or is your shock management going to be challenging because your left ventricle has failed or you'll need vasoactive medications? And are there rare complications from viral infections like pericardial effusion? Or is there some severe chamber dysfunction uh, that might be related to a myocarditis picture? And lastly, is there something completely out there that is a different diagnosis altogether than what you were entertaining? And this is, of course, one of our favorite uses of cardiac ultrasound, where it really leads to that plot twist, as I like to call it, where you were down one pathway, calling this pneumonia or COVID, and in fact, it turns out to be garden variety pericardial tamponade. And so those are great saves. In closing, Cardiac ultrasound is obviously an extremely versatile and scalable bedside tool that is available to everybody. Shock differentiation and chamber assessment can be done anywhere from the back of an ambulance all the way through to the operating room or the ICU and everywhere in between. The value of this tool is highlighted in a pandemic uh, in light of our more efficient and scaled down workflows. Uh, and I expect that now is a great time if you're not using this tool to pick it up and maximize its value for your own clinical practice. And acquiring echo images while otherwise doing other ultrasound pictures, such as central venous access or lung ultrasound, uh, is a great way to maximize the value of your patient encounter. At its essence, echo should be used to rapidly evaluate for complications of the infection and complicating prior cardiac disease. And more nuanced users will use uh, maybe more sophisticated techniques, like I've alluded to, to guide hemodynamics. Uh, however, the bulk of the value of this tool is in the views and in the concepts I've emphasized today. So with that, I hope that's been useful to you. If you have any questions or comments, please find me at the below contact details, and I'll speak to you again soon.